Hello students, welcome to IAS by heart. Welcome to the 21st session of the prelims HEAST series. So far, we have completed 20 sessions and covered 200 questions, which have high probability of featuring in your UPSC prelims 2021. Today is the last day of March. From tomorrow, you have exactly 88 days more for prelims 2021, which is on June 27. So I request you to pull up your socks and start working as hard as you can. So those of you who have been preparing for mains all along, stop it now and uh, start focusing on your prelims preparation. Okay. So coming back to this session, today we have 10 questions. Without further delay, let's jump into the first question. So the first question is about the appointment of Chief Justice of India. We have three statements here. First statement says the constitution of India does not have any provision or for criteria and procedure of appointing the CJI. The procedure is initiated by the law minister seeking the recommendation of the outgoing CJI at the appropriate time. And the third statement says the central government has no say in the appointment of the CJI. So I'll give you five seconds to give me an answer. So this question is about the appointment of Chief Justice of India, the Chief Justice of Supreme Court. So the answer to this question is, all the statements are true. So as far as appointment of Chief Justice of India is concerned, the constitution does not have any exclusive provision or criteria. The maximum they say is that there shall be a Supreme Court of India consisting of a Chief Justice of India. That's the only mention of Chief Justice of India in our constitution. And uh, there is uh, no mention of any procedure or criteria which has to be followed for the appointment of uh, the Chief Justice of India. But there is a, the closest mention comes in Article 126 where they talk about the appointment of an acting CJ. Here they say if the office of the Chief Justice of India is vacant, any other judge appointed by the president may occupy this office as long as a regular Chief Justice of India is appointed. That is the closest mention that we have here regarding the appointment of CJI. In the absence of constitutional provisions, the procedure relies on custom and convention. So let's look at what convention we follow. When the incumbent CJI retires, for example, the CJI right now is Sharath Arvind Bob Day. So he will retire in the month of May in the coming year. So when, a, when the incumbent CJI retires, the senior most judge in the Supreme Court becomes the CJI. That is the convention we follow. Seniority here is not defined by the age, but by the number of years an individual has been serving as a judge of the Apex Court. If you see Deepak Mishra and Justice uh, Chalami Shwarar, both of them were of the same age. But Deepak Mishra had more experience as serving as a judge of the Apex Court. That's why he was chosen as the Chief Justice of India in 2018. Okay. One more thing that you have to note here is there is a procedure for appointment of judges of Supreme Court and High Court that is there in the constitution, but we do not have any procedure for the appointment of Chief Justice of India exclusively. That is what the question is asking. So the procedure is the procedure is initiated by the law minister seeking the recommendation of outgoing CJI at the appropriate time, which is near to the date of retirement of the incumbent CJI. After that, the CJI will name his recommendation, will name his successor to the law ministry. And uh, in case of any misunderstandings or in case of any queries, the CJI will consult the collegium regarding the fitness of an SC judge to be elevated to the post of CJI. Okay. And after that, the law minister will forward it to the prime minister who will then advise the president on the same. And we know the president will administer the oath of office to the new CJI. So you see here, the government's role is very limited and they have no role. They have no say in the CJI's appointment. The law minister will request for the successor and he will take the recommendation to the PM and the PM will advise the president. That's the circle here. And the existing government has no say in who becomes the chief justice of India. Okay, oh, well, let's see why this question was asked. Because Justice N.V. Ramana, he was set to take over as the 48th CJI. Arvind Bobde just makes um, just recently made his formal recommendation to the government. Let's move on to the next question. The next question is from economy. So this is about the system of environmental economic accounting. Okay. SEEA provides a framework for measuring the link between the environment and the economy. 
So you can say that uh, from the name itself, you can deduce that a system of economic environmental accounting. So basically, it is a framework to link between the environment and the economy. The framework was adopted in 2015 under the Paris Climate Agreement. This is the second statement. I'll give you five seconds to give me an answer. So the answer to this question is one only. Let's see more about SEEA in the coming slide. So SEEA is nothing but a statistical system that brings together economic and the environmental information into a common framework to measure the condition of the environment, contribution of the environment to the economy and impact of the economy on the environment. So this is basically an accounting standards called a natural capital accounting. That is, you, you will account for the natural environmental capital in your country and how it is being utilized, how it is being exploited, how it is being um, impacted by different economic activities. This is guided by this SEEA. Okay. And uh, you have to note that it was adopted by UN Statistical Commission at the first international standard for environmental economic accounting in 2012 itself. We know that Paris Climate Agreement was signed only in 2015. But uh, this came into being in 2012 itself. So this, this being part of a Paris Climate Agreement, that statement is false. That's why the second statement was false and we arrived at option A. This will also look at individual environmental assets such as water resources, energy resources, etc. And how the, those assets are being moved between the environment and economy. So, for example, if we look at our environment or ecosystem, it provides a lot of services. For example, uh, protecting the soil cover, air purification, uh, exchange of gases, uh, limiting the pollution. A lot of these work are done by our environment. So this system tries to take account of this, the environmental, the economic value of all these ecosystem services being provided by the environment. So the basically the traditional measures such as GDP will not include these kind of relationships between the environment and economy. So that is what this is uh, trying to address. Okay, so let's also see about the NCAVES project. So the NCAVES project is nothing but the natural capital accounting and valuation of ecosystem services. It was launched under UN SEEA framework to advance the theory of and practice of ecosystem accounting and especially in the developing countries. This program project was funded by European Union, UN Statistics Division, United Nations Environment Program and the Secretariat of the Convention of Biological Diversity. So India is one of the five countries taking part in this project. So NCAVES project, we have five countries and India is uh, one of that. The other countries being Brazil, China, South Africa and Mexico. You see uh, four of these countries are from BRICS and only one non-BRICS country is Mexico. So in India, the NKS project is being implemented by the Ministry of Statistics and Implementation in close collaboration with Ministry of Environment, National Remote Sensing Center under the Department of Space. Okay, these are the entities involved from Indian side on NKS project. And uh, this uh, the project has also helped Ministry of Statistics to commence the compilation of the environment accounts in its annual publication, NV Stats India from 2018. So NV stats is nothing but an annual publication from Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. It was started in 2018. And this is based on the environmental accounting done under the NCAVES project. That's all you have to know here. Just go through all the different provisions we talked about in this question. Now let's move on to the next question. So this question is from IR. Uyghurs, an ethnic minority, belong to which of the following country? I'll give you five seconds to answer this question. You were very frequently in news, very many UN bodies talked about them, India talked about them on a human rights forum. So the answer to this question is China. Option D. So Uyghurs are nothing but a Turkish ethnic group originating in Central and East Asia, they belong to the Xinjiang province of China. There has been a global criticism on China over its treatment of this of the Uyghur population, 
especially about the forced labor camps and mass sterilization recently nike h&m many global companies they cancelled cotton procurement from jinjiang province because of the claims of forced labor and mass sterilization and uh, the but china denies allegations and says it equally protects the rights and interests of its ethnic minorities okay so these minorities live in tarim basin the rest live in urumqi which is the capital of xinjiang so the reason why this question was asked is because the un was in dialogue with china for unrestricted xinjiang visit so the rights group they allege abuse of at least 1 million uyghurs just uh, pause the video and have a look at this news this is very important from prelims perspective okay let's move on to the next question so this question is about the arctic council so it was formed in 1996 as an outcome of an agreement between iucn the nordic council and united nations environment program second statement says india and china recently became members of the council so i'll give you 5 seconds to give me an answer so the answer to this question is neither one nor two that is because both the statements are wrong so the arctic council it was formed in 1996 in canada by the signing of ottawa declaration and uh, the council was formed by eight circumpolar countries of russia us canada norway denmark sweden iceland and finland there is no role of these organization in the formation of this council all of these entities are nothing but observers of arctic council they did not help in the formation of this council and uh, this council was formed by signing an agreement between these eight circumpolar countries of the under uh, arctic ocean and uh, there are also six other organizations representing the arctic indigenous people who have status as permanent participants so the objective of this council is to promote cooperation coordination interaction among the arctic states together with indigenous communities and other arctic inhabitants okay and uh, the focus areas here are environment and climate change biodiversity oceans and the indigenous arctic people and its mandate you have to note it explicitly excludes military security so military domain is not talked about in the arctic council and uh, you also have to note that the decisions are non enforceable or any decision or guidelines or deliberations given by uh, arctic council is left to the prerogative of individual state they are not legally binding on the participant states recently india china south korea singapore italy japan got observer status at the council okay so we are not members only the countries which share boundary with the arctic ocean only they are the members so india china south korea singapore italy japan they all have only observer status at this council okay let's move on to the next question so this question is from arctic culture about uh, the chenta and elora caves first statement says while well, some of the rock cut uh, caves at elora were constructed before the common era all of ajanta caves were constructed after the common era second statement says bakataka kingdom was associated with the construction of some of the ajanta caves third statement says in ajanta paintings various skin colors are used in the paintings which represent a multi colored population okay i'll give you 5 seconds the answer to this question is d 2 and 3 only okay because ajanta caves was much older than elora caves so first statement is wrong ajanta caves were constructed before the common era whereas all of elora caves were constructed after the common era the statements are interchanged okay and uh, the second statement is true bakataka kingdom and the kings of bakataka dynasty they helped in the construction of some of the ajanta caves and the third statement is also true a different skin colors showing a multicolored population was present in the ajanta paintings let's see more about these caves individually in the coming slides so ajanta caves they are in shayadri ranges in western ghats on the bagora river near aurangabad both the caves are in 
Aurangabad only. And it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It has 29 caves. Note here, all of them are Buddhists. Okay. And we have 25 Viharas and 4 Chaityas. Viharas are nothing but residential complexes for the Buddhist monks, whereas Chaityas are prayer halls. Okay. And uh, the construction period was between 200 BC and 650 AD, which means it was constructed before common era as well as during common era. Okay. And uh, the, they had the patronage of Bakataka kings and Harishena, King Harishena was the prominent one. They are uh, mentioned in the travel accounts of Buddhist travelers, Chinese Buddhist travelers of Fahein, Kyunsan. And uh, figures in these caves were done using fresco painting. It is the technique of painting using limestone and uh, uh, making them a paste in the wall and letting it dry. So at the end of the painting, it will become a part of the wall itself. And the outlines of the painting were uh, done predominantly in red color. Okay, you can see from these images how red color dominated most of the cave paintings. And one of the striking features is the absence of blue color in these paintings. The paintings were multicolored, but uh, blue color was predominantly absent. And the general theme of these paintings were Buddhism, the life of Buddha, and Chattakat stories. So this is the Ajanta Caves. You can see two stories here, one ground floor and one first floor. This was built in these caves in Chayadri ranges in Western Ghats. Now let's look at Elora Caves. So these are the Elora Caves. They are located 100 km away from Ajanta Caves. This is a group of 34 caves. Ajanta had 29 caves, all Buddhist, but here we have 34 caves of uh, with 17 Hindu, 12 Buddhist and 5 Jain caves. Okay, this is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site and the period was between 5th and 11th centuries AD. So these caves were excavated entirely in the common era, entirely during the common era and they are very new compared to the Ajanta caves. That is also you have to note. And they are developed by various guilds from Vidarbha, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. And uh, the Elora caves had the patronage of Rashtrakutas, Kalachuris, Chalukyas and the Yadavas. The caves are devoted to Buddhism, Hinduism and Jainism. This illustrates the spirit of tolerance in the ancient India. Okay. And the most remarkable of these cave temples is the Kailasa temple. And you can see here one of the interesting facts is that uh, Elora caves are triple story. Triple story. Whereas Ajanta caves had only two stories. That is the ground floor and first floor. But we have here a ground floor, first floor and second floor. And this is the great Kailasanada temple. And uh, one more interesting fact is that this temple was made not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. That is, they sculpted the Vimana first and then went to the foundation. So uh, recently, the development of Ajanta and Yellora caves for tourism was issued in the Rajya Sabha by the BJP Rajya Sabha MP from Aurangabad. So that's why I had asked you this question about Ajanta and Yellora. Let's move on to the next question. With reference to environmental protection in India, which of the following is are our legally binding conventions? So we have three conventions here. You have to find which of them are legally binding. UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Vienna Convention for the Protection of Ozone Layer, United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. I'll give you five seconds to give me an answer. The answer to this question is, boy, three only. Let's see more about these conventions. So first convention, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So India is not legally bound under this convention and there is no legally binding commitment for India under FCC till date. Okay. And India has been actively engaged in multilateral negotiations. But you have to know we don't have any targets or goals to abide by. Okay. And then we have the ozone layer convention, the Vienna convention, which is also a non-binding international agreement developed to address the problem of stratospheric ozone depletion. That is also not legally binding. But the United Nations convention to combat desertification, that is a, the sole legally binding international agreement 
linking environment and development to sustainable land management that is what you have to note here the convention addresses specifically the arid semi arid dry sub humid areas known as the dry lands so this convention entirely deals with dry land and desertification and it is also legally binding but uh, the targets that the countries gives are voluntary you have to give voluntary goals and targets but you have to bind by that let's move on to the next question question number 7 from modern india the british had pledged to withdraw and leave that area once they won the war but later on instead of fulfilling the promise of leaving the area they rather started to expand their territory this sparked off a rebellion in that area identify the rebellion so we have uh, two clues here we are talking about the first burma war and uh, the british promise of leaving that area but not fulfilling that promise so this rebellion is associated with which of the following options the answer to this question is a home uprising so on the eve of anglo burmese war in 1824 david scott the agent of the governor general of the northeast frontier province he assured assamese of non interference and that they were forced to defend the frontier you see in 1824 there was this uh, constant threat from the burmese army that uh, the area might get attacked okay so the british agent he to, uh, he came to the rescue of the assamese and they told them they would not interfere in the affairs of assamese and they are only forced to defend the frontier okay but uh, the assamese people also felt relieved as they saw the british as protectors from burmese tyranny the uh, british also pledged to withdraw after the first burma war but we know that this did not happen so in contrast they attempted to incorporate the ahom territories in the company's dominion after the war so this sparked off a rebellion in 1828 under the leadership of gomdar konwar you also have to remember the leader of the ahom uprising he is gomdar konwar but uh, this uh, uprising was suppressed by the by the company's military however a second revolt was planned again in 1830 but this time the company under a pacifying policy handed over upper assam to maharaja purendra singh narendra in 1833 thus a part of the kingdom was restored to the raja while the rest came under the control of the company that is the southern assam so by doing this they were able to check any of the aggression by the burmese army at the same time they were able to pacify this rebellion so gondar konwar he was one of the military generals of the king purendra singh narendra that's all you have to remember here i ask this because uh, elections are coming up in assam and different political parties were talking about the leaders of assam national movement okay let's move on to the next question this question is about the sati portal it was launched to facilitate promotion of self reliance and indigenization in artificial intelligence sensitization of the masses about energy conservation and efficient use real time monitoring of implementation of various energy conservation programs skill training to rural youth in handling solar installations okay i'll give you 5 seconds to answer this question the answer to this question is option c real time monitoring of implementation of various energy conservation programs so i'll give you a trick uh, if a portal has double e together usually it is about energy efficiency okay usually it is about energy efficiency and either bee or ministry of power is involved so this is a little bit uh, of a hack this may not be true all the time but uh, mostly this might be true sati so here also if you see sati stands for state wise actions on annual targets and headways on energy efficiency so you can see this portal was launched to facilitate real time monitoring on the progress of implementation of various energy conservation endeavors at state level so various energy efficiency programs are introduced by the center how are they how well are they implemented and the real time monitoring of that progress 
So that is what this portal does. And this was launched by the Ministry of Power and developed by Bureau of Energy Efficiency. And this is expected to help in decision making, coordination, control, analysis, implementation, and enforcement of the compliance process. So you can see the Sati's website here being launched by the Minister of Power. Okay, let's move on to the next question. So this is the ninth question on institution of eminence. Institutes with IOE tag will be given greater autonomy, freedom to decide fees, course, course duration and governance structures. Second statement says for private institutions with IOE tag, there will be assured annual financial support. We have two statements here and I'll give you five seconds to answer this question. So the answer to this question is one only option A, because uh, you have to note for private institutions, there is no annual financial support only for public institutions with IOE tag. We have assured annual support of thousand crores. Okay. Let's see more about this tag in the coming slide. So institutions of eminence, UGC has nominated 20 institutions for IOE tag. And these institutions were nominated on the recommendations of empowered expert committee headed by N. Kopal Swami. And these institutes will be given greater autonomy, freedom to decide fees, course duration and governance structure. Okay. And uh, institutes with this tag could now set up campuses in foreign countries. What they have to do is they have to get an NOC certificate from the Ministry of External Affairs and Home Affairs. If they do that, they are free to set up campuses in foreign countries. And another technical detail is that they can set up a maximum of three off campus centers in five years, but not more than one in an academic year. So this is the most important provision. The public institutions are given a government grant of 1000 crores, while private institutions will not get any funding under the scheme. What private institutions get is uh, the status of uh, being an institution of eminence and a greater autonomy. That's all the private institutions will get. We have come to the final question of our session. Question number 10. This is about the Shram Shakti portal. So they are asking which of the following statements is not true. So Shram Shakti portal is launched to address the data gap related to migrant workers. It was launched by the Ministry of Labor and Employment. Aims to link the migrant population with existing migrant welfare schemes. All of the statements given here are true. So I'll give you five seconds to give me an answer. So the answer to this question is option B. This statement is wrong because Shram Shakti portal was launched by Ministry of Tribal Affairs. Many of you might get confused by uh, the term Shram. If uh, Shram comes, it means labor. So Ministry of Labor and Employment might have launched this, you might think. But uh, the answer is Ministry of Tribal Affairs because this portal is exclusively for tribal migrant workers. Okay. Tribal migrant workers. Let's see the explanation. Recently, the Ministry of Tribal Affairs has launched Shram Shakti, a national migration support portal. Okay. For a uh, to smooth the formulation of state and national level programs for migrant workers. And uh, they have also launched a training manual, Shram Sati, for tribal migrant workers. And it has been launched to collect data related to tribal migrant workers and uh, link them with existing welfare schemes. For example, the, there were uh, various schemes launched for migrants during the Atmanirbar package. For example, PM Swanidhi, etc. So this portal will help these workers identify these kind of schemes, both center and state. Okay. So let's look at the objectives of this portal. It is to address the data gap because we know that we don't have enough data about the migrant laborers in the country. And it will also help in formulation of strategies and uh, it will address the various issues related to migrants like trafficking, uh, wage harassment issues, occupational hazards, and various other harassment issues that they face in their workplace. And uh, this will also link them with other schemes. So this is the Minister for Tribal Affairs, Mr. Arjun Munda. He 
he launched this scheme so ministry of tribal affairs launched this shram shakti portal that's what you have to remember so that's all we have today let's have a quick recap of the different questions that we saw today the first question we saw about the appointment of cji here we go primarily by convention we do not have any exclusive uh, constitutional provisions for the appointment of cji and justice nv ramanna is going to become the 48th cji for our country and then we saw about the system for environmental economic accounting and this deals with the natural capital accounting and we also saw about nkaves project which is uh, being launched by un statistical division european union and un environment program india is one of the five countries that is taking part in this project and uh, this project is implemented in india by the ministry of statistics and program implementation and we saw about uyghurs they belong to the xinjiang province of china okay they are ethnic mi muslim minorities in this chinese province and then we saw about arctic council it has eight members six permanent participants belonging to the indigenous arctic communities and then we saw about ajanta and elora caves ajanta caves are older than elora caves ajanta caves have 29 caves whereas elora caves have 34 caves and uh, all the caves in ajanta caves are belong to the buddhism whereas elora caves have hindu buddhist and chain caves okay we also saw who patronized these caves and then coming to the sixth question important environmental conventions we saw that the convention on un convention to combat desertification as the sole legally binding treaty related to land development sustainable land management and then we saw about a home revolt and the first anglo burmese war and we saw who is the leader of this revolt gomdar kanwar okay he was the leader of the ahom uprising but it was uh, suppressed by the british in later stages and we saw about sati portal this portal is to look at the energy efficiency program the stage of the progress of implementation of different energy conservation programs by the states and uh, we saw about the institutions of eminence and how the private institutions they do not get any annual funding whereas uh, the public institutions get up to 1000 crores per year and finally we saw shram shakti portal launched by ministry of tribal affairs okay these are the 10 questions we saw today so i have given you the pdf format of this presentation in the description box below have a look at the 10 questions given here these have high probability of featuring in your upsc 2021 prelims so that's all we have here thank you for attending this session if you have any questions type it in the comment box below we will uh, definitely get back to you and also stay tuned for upcoming sessions thank you that's all we have here